a list. We're going to try to keep it short and simple, but on the same note, we want to get all the information we can out to you. This is for you, you know. This is all these people come in from out of town, and there's a lot of information that we need to to get out tonight, and hopefully, you know, you can take a little bit home with you. So I'd like to call our first uh, presenters if they're ready. And um, this is the Rocky Mountain PBS uh, crew. They're going to be doing a short presentation about a documentary they're going to be airing before the uh, November 29th uh, anniversary. So I'll go ahead and turn the, turn the microphone over to them. They're going to do their presentation and talk about the show that they're going to be on. They're having a TV show as well that runs. Okay, yeah, I'll go ahead and turn it over to them. Um, they'll fill you all in, more information. So uh, just, you know, bear with us and we'll put out the information. Thank you. Do you want me to go up there? Okay, I'll go up here. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Julie Spear, and I am a senior executive producer with Rocky Mountain PBS, which is a PBS station in Denver. How many of you guys watch PBS? The hands, anyone? Awesome. Thanks for watching. So um, basically, the way PBS works is each state has their own PBS station. And um, so we're out of Denver. and. Um, we're going to be working on a project on Sand Creek, and I'm going to let Mario introduce herself as well. So I'm the executive producer, and I'm going to be the director of this show. And I'm Mario Rodriguez Miguel, and I'm the produce, one of the producers on Colorado Experience, and I'll be producing the episode that we create on Sand Creek. And so the show that we're producing is a historical documentary series, uh, 13 half-hour documentary-style shows. And we capture the people, places, and events that created Colorado. And clearly, we're talking today about a very important event in the history of Colorado. And so we first just wanted to thank you so much for having us here. We're honored to be here with you this week. And I'll let Julie tell you a little bit more about the show that we're producing on Sand Creek. So we've been working with the Sand Creek Descendants Committee and the folks from the National Park for many months and um, have gotten approval and have been working with all four of the tribes. So um, we'll be here filming tonight and tomorrow and on Thursday. So we'd like to put out an invitation. If anyone here has family stories oral stories from Sand Creek, we would love to talk to you. So we'll be um, in the back of the room. So if you do and, and feel compelled to, to work with us, we would love that. And um, the show is going to air on television on November 27th, and then um, available on the internet after that. And we'll offer it to the tribes as well. Um, maybe we can do a screening here again in a couple of months. So thank you very much for having us, and I look forward to meeting you. Bye-bye. So I give it back to Max. Now, if anybody has any kind of stories or want to talk about a little bit, if you know anything about your family history related to it, go ahead and get with them. Uh, they're going to be conducting interviews tonight, uh, later on tomorrow, and uh, also Thursday. So they'll be here for the duration of our, all three of our forums. So feel free to go ahead and uh, talk with them, share a story, talk about your family history, anything. It's, it's, you know, it's important. Our next presenter is coming in. Uh, first met David a couple years ago at the Sand Creek Healing Run, 2011, and then I was impressed by him just standing up there and just spilling out information without any notes in front of him or a book, and uh, kind of kick-started my history and then. I guess um, I'm still learning. I, I'll probably still be learning for a long time, and there's more I want to know. And once I find out more about one subject, it leads me to another subject, and all this stuff is starting to tie to, tie together. And it finds out that you know it all traces back to here, or you know somewhere where Shine Rapples have always been. <clears throat> but one of the things that I was uh, didn't know, like I said earlier, you won't learn it in schools, you won't learn it up even into the college levels unless you go out there and do your own research and really dig for that inform information, which 
You know, amongst us, like me, I, you know, I never really went out there and dug any further in the Sand Creek history or anything like that. So you won't find the details that actually took part of the massacre. Um, behind this screen, we have a, a, a print of a ledger drawing that um, the uh, Ben and Gail Ridgely's father did. And it displayed those details on there on the elk hide. Um, that's what it meant to him. That's what it felt him to do. But I like to call David up here to do his uh, overview about the Sand Creek Massacre. And I want to caution some of you might have little children. They might not want to hear this. You may not want them to hear this. But, you know, it's, it's the truth. It's what really happened to our people. It was that gory, you know, and it was just terrible. So I like to call David up here. He's going to give the brief Sand Creek Massacre story. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for the meal. Um, I've been given a very hard uh, job here tonight, and that is to talk about uh, really a, a, an unspeakable thing that happened. 150 years ago. And some of the things that I'm going to say are um, jarring, they're, um, they're horrific, they're even obscene. But to understand the Sand Creek Massacre, the first thing to understand about it was that it was a massacre. To, uh, to try to put it in context, I think we should begin with the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie, which uh, involved most of the Plains tribes, including the Cheyenne and Arapaho. And by that treaty, the Treaty of 1851, the Fort Laramie Treaty, the Cheyenne and the Arapahoes were given a vast territory of land stretching from the crest of the Rocky Mountains to parts of what uh, is now Wyoming uh, into eastern uh, Kansas, Colorado, a huge tract of land. And that treaty was to last as long as the grass will grow and the streams will flow forever and forever lasted 10 years. In 1859 came the great Colorado Gold Rush, setting off the greatest single mass migration of people in American history. 100,000 people streamed across the Cheyenne and Arapaho lands to the gold that was in uh, the mountains just west of Denver. <clears throat> and because uh, they were on uh, land they didn't, uh, that was illegal for them to be on, they had to negotiate, the, the government had to negotiate a new treaty. And this was the Treaty of Fort Wise of 1861. It was to clear the title to the land so that whites could live on it. That uh, reservation was one thirteenth the size of the Fort Laramie uh, Treaty. It was a small tract of land in central southeastern Colorado, anchored uh, on the south by the uh, Arkansas River, and uh, went over a barren uh, sweep of land that was by this time pretty much devoid of uh, any animals to hunt, particularly buffalo. Still, the uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho um, tried to live with the whites, and things uh, progressed until the spring of 1864. 
at a place called Fremont's Orchard. Some uh, Cheyennes were uh, taking some horses back to um, their white owner, a man that they knew who was married into the uh, Cheyenne tribe. And as they were doing that, they ran into a company of soldiers, uh, soldiers that were part of the 1st Colorado Regiment. And the soldiers, instead of asking what was going on, opened fire. And that began the War of 1864. The um, soldiers followed that up with an attack at a place called Cedar Canyon in Colorado. And there they killed women and children. Uh, they captured one uh, man and roasted him over the fire so that he would give the uh, location of the village. And still, the Cheyenne and Arapahoes couldn't understand why these attacks were coming. In uh, May, the soldiers attacked, again without uh, any warning, a village that was uh, led by uh, uh, Chief Lean Bear and Black Kettle was also there. Lean Bear had been to Washington the year before, had met President Lincoln, had a peace medal, and so he uh, advanced towards the troops, um, making signs of peace. And when he got within rifle distance, he was shot down. And then, to, when he fell off his horse, the soldiers ran over his body and fired more shots. And now, uh, this war that no one understood uh, was now uh, uh, in a white heat. And the Cheyenne and Arapahoes retaliated. And so it went back and forth. About this time, Governor John Evans issued a proclamation to the, what he called the peaceful Indians of the Plains, of the Cheyenne and Arapaho. And he said that those who were not at war were to go into um, forts and uh, give themselves up to the military. Well, it was very difficult to get word to the, to the tribes. But when they finally found out that uh, this offer had been uh, uh, proclamated, uh, they met uh, the commander at Fort Lyon and uh, asked for uh, a peace parley. And the commander uh, agreed, and he took them to Denver to meet with Governor Evans and a man named Colonel John M. Shivington. Remember that name. In Denver, at Camp Weld, the um, chiefs uh, sat there and listened to Governor Evans um, tell why he couldn't make peace, even though he had offered uh, in his June proclamation that, that uh, those who were not at war could come in and be uh, protected. Uh, he really didn't want to talk to the chiefs because as far as he was concerned, uh, there had to be a military solution. And since the war was now at hand, a war that was begun by the military, uh, that if they wanted peace, they had to not talk to him, but to talk to the military. And at the end of this conference, John M. Shivington, the commander of the Colorado District, said, if you are uh, wanting peace, go to Fort Lyon and give yourselves up to military authority, and you will be protected. So that's what they did. Black Kettle, White Antelope, Left Hand, uh, Little Raven, all went to Fort Lyon 
and the commander there began issuing them rations. Um, and they were talking every day, back and forth. Suddenly, that commander was removed, and a new one was uh, put in his place. And he was not comfortable with the Cheyennes and Arapahoes uh, camping so close to the fort. And so he told them, I I'm not going to feed, uh, I'm not going to issue rations anymore. Uh, but since you're at Sand Creek, 40 miles away, you stay there. You're under the protection of the U.S. government. You will be safe there. And when I find out what uh, my superiors want to do with you, I'll come out and tell you. So you had uh, uh, Chief Black Kettle, you had uh, Chief Left Hand at that, in that camp, you had up to 27 chiefs and headsmen in that village. This was a chief's village. And because it was a chief's village, there were very few men of fighting age in that camp. Perhaps uh, of the uh, 750 people there, perhaps 200 men of fighting age. Uh, a lot of orphans, a lot of uh, widows who um, um, received protection from the chiefs. There was a larger camp of Shine and Arapahoes on the Smoky Hill, around 50 miles away. But uh, this was the village uh, that had been promised protection by the United States government. On November 28, 1864, Colonel John M. Shevington and around 675 troops suddenly appeared out of nowhere at Fort Lyon. And Shevington, who was a barrel of a man, he was six feet four uh, with a chest that stretched his uniform, bearded, a former Methodist preacher. In fact, the head of the Methodist Church at one time in Colorado and what is known as the Rocky Mountain uh, District. Shivington came in, surrounded the fort so that nobody, not even soldiers, could, could um, uh, get out of the fort and he announced that he was there to uh, kill Indians and that he was going to attack the village at Sand Creek. Now, some of the officers at the, in that uh, fort said, well, you, you, you can't do that. Those people at Sand Creek have been promised protection. And Shivington yelled out, damn any man who is in sympathy with Indians. And at 8 o'clock in the evening, Shivington left the fort and started towards Sand Creek. The soldiers uh, marched all night and arrived at the camp at dawn. And then they charged that village. It wasn't quite uh, sunup. The light was dim. But with those 675 troops were four mountain howitzers, 12 pounders, that um, the, the killing power of those cannon those howitzers is, is frightening. Uh, they, sh they can shoot out a spherical case uh, shell. It's a round iron ball that will explode. And then inside are these uh, mini balls or um, uh, just filled with those. And those burst. 
and it's a, um, it's a lethal weapon. As the soldiers attacked, white antelope uh, walked towards the soldiers. White antelope had first been to Washington in 1851, met the president, got a peace medal, was a known peace chief. And uh, as he advanced, uh, he was singing a, a song, his uh, journey song, and he was shot down. He was uh, among the first to die. The uh, people looked towards Black Kettle, and Black Kettle had above his lodge the United States flag with a white flag of, of peace underneath it. And he said, the, the, the soldiers aren't going to hurt us. They're here to, to tell us uh, what we're supposed to do. But as he was saying that, people were, were dropping all around him. And so you saw the village men, women, and children, mothers with babies in their arms, fleeing upstream, away from the soldiers. And it didn't matter who they were, they were shot down. Uh, screams uh, pierced the air. The men, and remember there are only about 200, uh, quickly got to their weapons, bows and arrows maybe, uh, mainly, and uh, defended the women and children who were now desperately trying to, to, to get out of the way. And they started digging sand pits, um, trying to get their babies into some sort of protection. But uh, the soldiers just uh, chased them. Uh, these pits were all along, some uh, maybe a fourth of a mile outside of camp, even, even less. Others, uh, about uh, two miles, were digging pits. And uh, most of these pits turned into death pits uh, because the soldiers then brought up the cannons and began firing point blank into them. But the, uh, the men fought with a desperation, protecting their families. Then the awful thing began. As uh, the people were killed, the soldiers went among the dead and started mutilating them, scalping, cutting off body parts. It was a, uh, there was no command uh, structure. Um, the, the soldiers were just uh, uh, in groups, just chasing as, as fast as they could, running down anybody they could. Uh, this went on for six to nine hours. And uh, at night, um, it got bitter cold. Uh, mothers were uh, trying to find grass, those who survived, to wrap their children. Uh, they were, most of them, without any clothing. Um, they had gotten away. Many did get away. But as many, uh, and perhaps more, 200 people were killed. Of those 200, 150 were women and children and babies and elderly ones. Uh, perhaps uh, 50 fighting men were killed. The survivors um, made their way to the Smoky Hill camps uh, where they got protection from the large village that was there. Uh, that was a huge village, and if Shivington had attacked there, he would have never have gotten out alive. 
So that's the bare bones of this unspeakable day, a day of horror. And the effects of that are still being felt today. The, um, the immediate aftermath was that the troops returned to Denver carrying the body parts that were taken at Sand Creek from the bodies of the dead. And on December 28, December 29, and December 30th in Denver at a theater, they displayed these uh, to the public. The Rocky Mountain News said that scalps were getting as plentiful as toads in Egypt on the streets of Denver. Shivington and his men returned to a hero's welcome and said that the Cheyenne and the Arapaho had been destroyed. Well, on January 7th, at a place called Julesburg, Colorado, on the Platte River, and the Cheyenne and Arapahoes with their Lakota um, allies struck Julesburg, and, and, it's, and there was a fort there, and um, sacked it. And then on a 100-mile front, the warriors attacked every stage station, every ranch, every wagon train, and shut the road to Denver down. That road to Denver was like an umbilical cord. If supplies couldn't get through, Denver would starve. And they weren't done yet. From January 2nd until about October 1st, that great army of perhaps 1,500 warriors struck from Colorado to Montana and destroyed everything. Everything they came across. Because if this chief's village could be attacked, this peaceful camp that was under the protection of the flag, then nobody was safe. The United States Army was out to kill them all. And so they fought for their lives. They made their last stand. And they continued that fight uh, clear through the Battle of the Little Bighorn and the destruction of Custer 12 years later. I want to uh, read you parts of two letters. And this is where it gets really tough. Uh, they are almost obscene. Two soldiers, Captain Silas S. Soule and Lieutenant Joseph A. Kramer of the 1st Regiment, a part of the attack on Sand Creek. These two men refused to fire at Sand Creek. They disobeyed direct orders with a heroism that is seldom seen. When you are in the field disobeying refusing to fire or to allow your company to fire. Uh, over a hundred men refused to fire. They knew left hand. They knew white antelope and black kettle. And when they found out that this is the village that they were, that they were attacking, um, they refused to fire. And so, uh, two weeks after the massacre, both of them sat down and wrote letters 
to their superior officer, detailing the horror of that day. And so let me just read, uh, I can't read the whole thing because it, it would take too long and there's parts of it that we just can't. The first one uh, was uh, written by Silas Soule on December 14, 1864. And it's to uh, Major Edward Wynkoop, or Winecoop. And this is, this is what he says. I refused to fire and swore that none but a coward would, for by this time hundreds of women and children were coming towards us and getting on their knees for mercy. Anthony shouted, kill the sons of bitches. The massacre lasted six or eight hours. I tell you, Ned, it was, a hard, it was hard to see little children on their knees, have their brains beat out by men professing to be civilized. One woman was wounded, and a fellow took a hatchet to finish her. She held up her arms to defend herself and he cut one arm off and held the other with one hand and dashed the hatchet through her brain. One woman with her two children were on their knees begging for their lives of a dozen soldiers within 10 feet of them all firing. When one succeeded in hitting the woman in the thigh, when she took out a knife and cut the throats of both children and then killed herself. One old woman hung herself in the lodges. There was not enough room for her to hang and she held up her knees and choked herself to death. Some tried to escape on the prairie, but most of them were run down by horsemen. I saw two women take hold of one another's hands chased until they were exhausted when they kneeled down and clasped each other around the neck and were both shot together. They were all scalped. They were all horribly mutilated. One woman was cut open and a child taken out of her and scalped. And he adds, it was almost impossible to save any of them. Four days later, Lieutenant Kramer wrote, Dear Major, this is the first opportunity I have had of writing you since the Great Indian Massacre. And for a start, I will acknowledge I am ashamed that I was in it with my company. After the fight, there was a sight I hope I may never see again. Men, women, and children were scalped, fingers cut off to get the rings on them, and this as much with officers as regular soldiers, and one of those officers a major, and a lieutenant colonel cut off ears of all he came across. A woman ripped open and a child taken from her. Little children shot while begging for their lives. Women shot while on their knees. And with their arms around soldiers are begging for their lives. And all of the indignity shown their bodies that was ever heard of. He adds it as a postscript. One little child, three months old, was thrown in the feed box of a wagon and brought one day's march and they're left on the ground to perish. 
This is why Sand Creek, of all of the crimes against Indian peoples, is the worst atrocity ever committed by U.S. troops. And it, in a way, defined the relationship not only between the Cheyenne and Arapahoes and the U.S. government, but the news of Sand Creek spread. And again, if Black Kettle and Left Hand could be treated this way, then no one was safe. So the trauma of this uh, has been a, a very hard thing for Cheyenne and Arapaho people. And the, the thing to remember is that the United States government, once it found out what really happened there, never denied responsibility. By the uh, late December, the letters that Sol and Kramer wrote found their way to Washington and caused an investigation into Sand Creek. What had been termed a great victory was now seen as a terrible massacre. Two congressional committees plus an army commission investigated. Remember that in the Civil War, um, with the North and South fighting, uh, fighting that involved hundreds of thousands of soldiers. No event in the Civil War received more attention than Sand Creek. The Treaty of 1865, Treaty of the Little Arkansas, is an astounding document. Article 6, the United States government admitted guilt for Sand Creek, that it was an unprovoked attack on a peaceful village. And it's the only treaty uh, signed, ratified, and proclaimed by the United States that promised reparations to uh, those who suffered at Sand Creek. And there is a specific um, clause that says what those reparations are to be in land, in goods, to widows and orphans and to chiefs. And those reparations have never been paid. It's still out there. As recently as September 2014, in a decision handed down by the federal court on Sand Creek, it is written, this was the worst crime in American history. So the United States government has never denied its responsibility. Uh, but there is plenty of responsibility to go around. Um, the Methodist Church has uh, uh, gone on record to apologize for its role in Sand Creek because 
Governor John Evans was a leading Methodist, and John Shivington was the leader of the church in Colorado. And they have been very active uh, in recent years in funding uh, projects like uh, the Research Center for the um, Sand Creek. Um, and they are, are, are looking and they have now authorized an investigation, an independent investigation of the church uh, and its role in Sand Creek. So the um, healing run, and uh, Caden will say much more about this, but the healing run is a way of coming to terms with Sand Creek. And the path follows the route that the soldiers took back to Denver carrying those body parts to cleanse the way. So that's a very quick uh, um, overview of Sand Creek. And um, after the end of the program, there will be some questions. If you have any, I'd be pleased to answer them. Thank you. You know, I hope this uh, enlightens you to remember November 29th for what it really was. And we are all descended from that here, all the southern Cheyenne Arapahoes. We can trace that lineage up there somehow, some way. Um, so our next presenter, uh, Craig Moore, is going to talk a little bit about that and how you might be able to find your descendancy and uh, about around Sand Creek or how you may be evolved. He, I met, first met Craig years ago. I won't say how long, but um, he was able to help me find out how I'm uh, directly connected to it. He even gave me documents to back it up. So I want to call Craig up here. He can talk a little bit about genealogy and hopefully it'll give you guys an insight on that. Mr. Craig Moore from the National Park Service. Thank you very much. Again, it's an honor to be here. As we were, uh, well, I wanted to point out on the little colored flyer that we handed out, the photo at the top right hand corner, uh, his name is Little Bear. He uh, handed down one of the, uh, a story of what happened at Sand Creek. He was there, he was a young man. Uh, he lived for a number of years. Uh, I think he passed away about 1917 in the Calumet area. Um, he had a son that might have been there. His name was White Face Bull. Uh, Mini Red Hat, May Bull, Eddie Bull, um, those would be his, his family. Um, I noticed the Red Moon Circle coming in. Red Moon was one of the young men in the village. His father was one of the first Cheyennes to come onto the Southern Plains. Uh, they called him a hair rope man. And his name was Yellow Wolf. Red Moon, the community around Hammond. Um, I recall that uh, two of Red Moon's great granddaughters, um, Sage Woman, Eleanor, Heap of Crows Allrunner, uh, married Chief Jacob Allrunner from Thomas, and her sister, they called her Grass Woman, Bessie Flying Coyote, or Bessie Coyote. Uh, just recently, in the last couple of years, Reverend Johnny Bearshield, some of you may have known Johnny, he also is a great-great-grandson of Chief Red Moon through his grandfather, Walking Buffalo, or a guy they call Philip Bearshield. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched on TV, um, there's a show that calls Who Do You Think You Are? And it takes a celebrity, an athlete, or somebody from Hollywood, and it shows them on a journey to try to discover their family heritage. 
and they go to different places, follow the trail back, sometimes for hundreds of years. So um, my brief talk to you guys tonight, I call it, Who Do You Think You Are? Like the television show. Uh, a small dry creek in southeastern Colorado, 400 miles from Bear Butte, 400 miles from Concho, Today, quiet prairie land, so different from that day, November 29th, 1864. Great-grandparents, mothers, fathers, babies, children in chaos, terrified. A day when people were changed forever. Montana, the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Wyoming, Colorado. Where had they come from? Sweet medicine, society, ceremonies, and ancient covenants. Who were they? Horses prestige and power, buffalo, food, clothes, and shelter, a way of life, treaties, the winds of change, agents, annuities, reservations, trading posts and forts, alliances, new families, Bent, Hoffman, Hague, North, Curtis, Poisson, Bellini, Hauser, Otterby, block, to name just a few, cultural change, warfare, enemies, allies, captives, politics, and Sand Creek, 130 teepees or more, black kettle, white antelope, lone bear, sand hill, little robe, war bonnet, tall bear, big jake, standing water, your Arapaho chief left hand, many others, maybe 600 people. Who lived? Who was wounded? Who perished? What happened to them? How can they all be named 150 years later? A generation, two generations, three, four, five, six, seven generations now, 1864 to 2014. Thousands and thousands of faces now, four fourths to 128, many others and beyond, descendants, many still enrolled as CNAs, others far away, coast to coast, separated by oceans, deserts, mountains, and cities, many out of contact, out of touch, unaware, separated with the passing of generations. So who do you think you are? As the dust settled at Sand Creek, as the cries and screams faded into the night, some 160 lay lifeless, but many others lived. They crawled out of sand pits and holes. They appeared from behind sagebrush and driftwood. They raised from ravines and gullies. They climbed above the banks of Sand Creek itself. Dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, making their way north. Five miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, 20 miles. Cold, difficult, painful, toward the safety of other camps. How can they all be named? Newborns. Children, teenagers, young and old, men and women, hundreds of faces, the survivors. A girl running up Sand Creek, separated during the chaos from parents. Who was she? What became of her? 1880s allotment, 1920s citizenship, 1930s Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. Unbelievably, she lived through it all. Is this your great-grandma? A young warrior, 17, 18, maybe 20, athletic, fast. Who was he? He killed a soldier of Ejo that day, a man named Joseph Connor, also a young man about his age. Later, this man was at Beecher's Island, Washita, Adobe Walls, and Palo Duro Canyon. Is this your great-grandpa? Another young man herding horses when he heard and then saw the approach of strangers. Quick to action, dashing along the bluffs toward the village, desperately he turned. Soldiers to his south and east, so he headed upstream. Heels digging into the sand. For several miles he ran. A mini ball tore into his braid. Another ripped his buckskins. Bullets pounded like hail around him, but he made it from Sand Creek. Ten years later, shackled and imprisoned in a far-off place called Fort Marion, Florida. Could this be your great-grandpa? 
Is this where you come from? A young mother shot in the chest, hurting and scared, then shot again in the wrist. More lead, this time shot in the thigh. An hour, two, three hours, evening, she went north, a figure in the dark, but she escaped. Who was she? A baby, only minutes old, born during the mayhem, the shouts and the gunshots and exploding shells, coming into a world full of death and suffering, protected by the earth, sand, dirt, grass, and an old log, living to see another sunrise, another era, another land, Oklahoma, another language, English. Who was this baby? Was this your grandma or grandpa? An old man, cane in hand, struggling through the sand, stumbling, falling, crawling, praying, blessed his life, just enough energy to get out, to get away, squinting at the rising sun. Nobody could kill him, they had all tried. You, Crow, Shoshone, and now Eho. What was his name? Where was he from? Where did he go? Is this your great, great, great grandpa? Two sisters, maybe six, seven winters old, lost and confused. Orphans because of the massacre, exhausted and freezing. Only a morsel of food, starvation, only a sip of water. No signs of family, only a wolf on the hill. A hunting wolf, a howling wolf. They followed the wolf, so the story goes. She showed them the way, she saved their lives. A miraculous escape, two lives spared, growing old together, two sisters, mothers, grandmas, and great-grandmas. Is this where you come from? An old woman, a teepee maker, a chief's daughter, now her face etched with the marks of time, awakened by the shouts and screams, pushed forward by dozens of frantic people, a few like her, feeble, weary, and slow afoot. In moments, some shelter, a cut bank along Sand Creek, a place to dig, a place to hide in the sand. Maybe 30 others with her, crouching along the same creek. Safety in numbers, not here, not at Sand Creek. With the unlimbering of artillery, cannons, howitzers, numbers shrank as tribesmen fell victim to exploding shells. Here she huddled, an old lady, a chief's daughter, a medicine woman, Later, the shots quit coming, the air no longer filled with flying needles and iron balls. Under the cover of dark darkness, she made her way out of the valley, out of harm's way to the north. Who was she? What was her name? A matriarch, a grandmother of all the people. Sand Creek was a turning point. History would never be the same. For the Cheyenne and Arapaho, The holy man, Stone Forehead, and his son, Black Harry Dog, were still alive. Chiefs, fewer now after the slaughter, still sat in council. Seven bulls, Black White Man, Whirlwind, Red Moon, Wolf Robe, Prairie Chief, Little Bear, White Shield, Little Raven, and others. Ancestral lands across the high plains, home to generations of Cheyenne and Arapaho, soon would transition to the Red Earth and the Jip Hills of Indian Territory. Hammond, Clinton, Weatherford, Gary, Colony, Thomas, Watonga, Sealing, Kingfisher, Longdale. <clears throat> he was walking out west of El Reno, Darlington Road towards Calumet. Years ago, another autumn day across Canadian County. But this just wasn't any old boy. This was a grandson of Chief White Antelope, the chief who had been to Washington, D.C., the White House, the man who died singing a journey song. This was his grandson. He walked a little faster. His name, Kish Hawkins. I met his son once, Charlie Hawkins. Kish's mother was Blackhead, a daughter of White Antelope, a survivor of Sand Creek. Blackhead froze to death near here in December of 1933. On this day, Kish must have been thinking about Sand Creek, as he often did. With his nephew, Sam Dick, and a young Cheyenne boy named Joe Antelope, Hawkins was attempting to get legislation 
acknowledging an 1865 treaty that promised reparations to over 110 families and now their descendants who had been at the massacre. Hawkins' work was monumental. It is a foundation, a springboard for Sand Creek research and other efforts that continue into the present. Soon, with the approach of the massacre's 150th anniversary, Chief White Antelope, his grandson Kish Hawkins, his great-grandson Joe Antelope, and others, thousands and thousands and thousands of others, multiple generations, will each will be remembered in prayer, song, ceremony. We hope to see you there. After all, it, it, I would say it is who you are, Sand Creek. Thank you very much. I hope. Thank you, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Craig. Appreciate it. Well, now you know a little bit about the history, the uh, genealogy, the people that were there. Um, I'd like to call the Sand Creek representatives up to talk about where we're at or at present day, what their work have been, what they have been doing uh, as a part of being a representative and where the process is at present day. So I'd like to call uh, Henry up here first, just explain a little bit about his role and, and how long he's been with the representative in NAGPRA. <laughs> Hello, my name is Henry uh, Little Bird, and uh, I just want to say that uh, when I start working with Sand Creek, uh, we started working on the exhibit in, uh, in in Denver, and they had an exhibit about the uh, Sand Creek, and uh, it was more of a white man's version of the what happened. It didn't have no really. Uh, Indian stories in it are, uh, are a lot of things that happened, uh, like the, uh, the, the babies that were cut out of the stomachs and the, and the target practice on little kids, you know, and, uh, and you know, it was hard to, uh, sometimes it was hard for us to talk about the, uh, to the crowd because we'd, we'd get real emotional uh, about a lot of things that we heard, and uh, so as time went on, we uh, you know gained strength where we could uh, speak for them. Uh, so when we started at the ex the exhibit, uh, it was uh, offensive to us. Uh, it had a the beginning of it had a cartoon character, uh, kind of portraying us as cartoon characters, but you know. It was, uh, it was really uh, disgrading to us. It was, uh, uh, it was something that we wanted to take down. Uh, we wanted, to, we wanted to, to have them start the exhibit over, and uh, and have us, uh, you know, have say so in it. And uh, while well, they disagreed at the beginning. But now uh, the exhibit's closed, and they're going to redo it, and we're going to start uh, uh, setting up a temporary exhibit for the 150th, 50th, and uh, they're going to feed us and everything over there. So that's where I first started out is at the exhibit, and it was uh, it was good to see it closed, and uh, and uh, where they're going to start over, and and sign up where people will have word have a word in on it. And uh, when I when I uh, went to the uh, hundred the healing run, it was a gift from God to be there with them people. And uh, the little kids were happy. You know, they did. Everybody wanted their turn to run, and they were excited. And no one wasn't tired, and no one wasn't fussing. Everybody was happy, and they were enjoying themselves. You know, and that was a great feeling that. You could see the healing process that we all worked together, you know, and the kids were happy and they were just running down the road in cold weather. They didn't care. 
So it was a gift from God that we got to, to help them on the run. Uh, it, was a, it was a gift from God to uh, speak at the state capitol, you know, where, to explain to some of the people out there that, you know, we're, uh, we're, a, strong, we're a strong people. The Sand Creek had made us a, a stronger person, a, a stronger tribe than uh, we, was, we was at the beginning. We learned how to survive through the, the, the cold weather. The, uh, we learned how to survive with nothing. You know, we learned how to protect our children in uh, cold weather somehow, and uh, otherwise not any of us would be here. Uh, my great-great-grandfather mixed hair his parents were killed there. And my great-grandmother, uh, Susie Mixer, Paul Bear, that's the family I come from. Uh, we know exactly uh, where we came from, in the, uh, from the Sand Creek. So it's good to know that uh, that part of my history. And uh, it's a gift from God that, that we have a, a chance to talk about it. Uh, from far as I know, that all this was just brought back to light, you know, probably, uh, like they say, 22 years ago, if, it, if they never found the letters that was uh, stored in somebody's attic, then this would have never, uh, would have been, never been started up again. And if it wasn't for the soldiers that spoke out for us, Sand Creek would have never been recognized to anybody. So thank God for, uh, Captain, uh, Captain Silas Soul and uh, Lieutenant Kramer for not firing on us and uh, giving us a chance to, to pass by. Uh, so that's one of the things we do in Denver is we honor the, the, uh, them soldiers, the ones that uh, had pity upon us. Uh, it was really a gift that, uh, that the United Methodist people, they, uh, they the bishop had felt guilty about, you know, what, what their church had did to us. And she got her organi organization together and uh, they start making uh, preparations to, to make it right with us. Uh, they donated some money to our site and the, they're sponsoring runners for us. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're feeding, they feed here and there for us and then uh, as far as I know, I think they're going to make uh, reparations for the, to the tribe uh, by themselves. So that's one thing we're looking forward to. They'll probably do that before the government will. Uh, they uh, apologized to us. Uh, there was four of us in the room, and I asked them if, they, uh, if she could write a letter to our tribe because there was 13,000 other people back home that that wanted to hear them words too. So uh, she did, she wrote a letter to our uh, paper and, and uh, she, let, she, let, she let us all know how uh, sorry they were and, and how they wanted to help us in the future, you know, with our, uh, with our run and, our, and our different things that we're putting together like the, uh, like the little museum over there in uh, Eads. So they, they've been helping a lot with their money-wise and uh, through their prayers and stuff. And uh, back in, uh, well, a few months back, they took 600 people up to the, uh, the site. It was like 13 buses. It was a gift that, you know, we, we got to speak for our people there and to explain to some of the church people, you know, what uh, their, uh, the people before them had did to us. And uh, it made a lot of them cry. It made a, uh, they, they, just, they just kept on saying they were sorry, you know. And, uh, but we told them that we weren't there to point fingers. We were there to uh, explain to the people that we had, uh, we had gained strength from the massacre. And uh, it made us a stronger person. Uh, and, uh, Today that uh, we're really we're really doing good. We've um, we started off with this, just hundreds now. You know, just three thousand Arapahoes now, and then you know, just a 
few thousand Cheyennes, and you know, there's 8,000 now, and then up north, it's the same way, you know, the two-thirds more the people. So, like I said, it's made us a stronger person, and uh, I, I just think, uh, you know, the, the PBS, they helped us trying to get the news out about this, and they're making uh, videos for us, so I appreciate their help. Then the history of Colorado, and uh, Chantel, she's doing all the work, uh, most of the work, coordinating everything for the run and, and different things like the exhibit and stuff. So I'd like to appreciate all these people up here. And there's a lot of other people that hadn't, that didn't get to make it, like uh, Gary Roberts. He's, uh, he's been helping our tribe and studying this Sand Creek for 50 years, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's on my mind that we, you know, people like him that our tribe need, need to honor because he's taken so much time out of his life to help us. So that's one thing I'm looking forward to is getting to start honoring some of these people that, that give us the time and day, you know, and it's really a gift though that to be upon this earth today. And I uh, thank everybody for coming and uh, I appreciate it. I hope everybody learns more about where they came from. Uh, you know, when I was back in uh, Montana, I was talking to my Uncle Joe and he said that Mixer had a sister and they both ran. And so come to find out that uh, uh, Mary Kay Sweezy, she's our, our, uh, our aunt. There, that was her, that was her, uh, that was her great grandfather. And my great grandfather was, great great grandfather was her, her brother. So it's, it's stuff like that, you know, we don't know where we came from, but if you just ask around and, and, and you'll, it'll come to light. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming and I appreciate, you know, the food and the prayers and the CNA TV and the PBS. And I appreciate everybody. Oh. Henry Littlebird, the uh, Arapaho representative. Um, back in May, uh, the Denver University also honored the representatives and the descendants by, uh, they had a powwow and they had a special. And during that special, they invited all the representatives up there. Uh, Henry accepted this blanket right here on behalf of the uh, Southern Arapaho representatives. And uh, Karen, Little Coyote, accepted this one here on behalf of the Southern Cheyenne uh, representatives. So it's just a little something that, these are not just display, these are for all the descendants here in the Southern Cheyenne repos. And uh, we will get these framed or displayed here, maybe in a hall or somewhere. Um, so that, but these belong to the people here. Uh, with that said, I'd like to call Joe, the uh, Cheyenne, Rep Cheyenne uh, representative, Joe Big Medicine come up and uh, talk a little bit about his role. And he's the longest uh, running uh, representative. Like you say, he's there from day one. Joe. I'm from Watonga. I belong to the Scabby Band. During Sand Creek, there was a lot of bands out there. There was 10 bands of Cheyennes during Sand Creek. Only one band got attacked. There's exhibits educating people, the American people, our people that don't know about the massacre. We closed one down at the Colorado History Museum because it was offensive to us. We're redoing it. The other one is at Washington, D.C. of the Museum of the American Indian. Kevin Gover is happy to help us with that. And I already been to Washington already and had fun. But anyway, we're, we're still doing what we can do for our people to represent them and tell them and educate them about the St. Creek Massacre. And I'm glad to see all these guys here today. I'm glad all you guys came today. And that's about all I got to say. Ho ho.
Ho, oh, Joe Big Medicine. Uh, the other representative works with the Culture and Heritage Program too, and uh, has also worked with everybody here. Uh, Karen, little coyote. Good evening, I'm Karen Little Coyote, Southern Cheyenne, uh, Sand Creek representative. I am very thankful to be working with uh, this group of people that we work with with Sand Creek. We've, um, back in 2010, a family called National Park Service and stated that they had a, a scalp lock in their possession and they lived in San Diego. So uh, Karen called me and then we all got together and got together with the Northern Arapaho and the Northern Cheyenne. It was a Cheyenne scalp, scalp lock that was taken from Sand Creek. And this family, uh, this soldier from 1864, displayed it in his home as a trophy. So the family didn't want it anymore, so that's when they caught National Park Service. So we flew out with the Northern, uh, Northern Cheyenne to San Diego and we repatriated that Cheyenne scalp lock. And then we drove it back from San Diego to Obent's Fort, to the repository where it stayed until we uh, made burial plans there. So we uh, you know, put that person's spirit to rest the best way we knew how. We had a ceremony, sang songs, a memorial song, journey song, so that spirit could be at rest and be at peace. So, you know, that's just, you know, some of what we do with Sand Creek. It's very interesting. It's um, heartbreaking at times. And I'm just thankful to be a part of Sand Creek with, with David, and with all these people that are so knowledgeable about Sand Creek, have learned a lot and uh, the National Park Service has a cooperative agreement that, that the government gave them, and um, that's what we travel on. The money is uh, within our tribe here, and that's, that's the money that we use to travel on to uh, with Sand Creek business there. Uh, the government pays for, for um, our mileage, our trips up there and back, our hotel stays and our meals. So I just wanted to share that with you about Sand Creek that, uh, you know, there's still body parts out there, remains out there that haven't come, come forward. And there's even right now, there's still an Arapaho scalp lock in the Karl May Museum in Germany. We're still working on that, try to uh, repatriate that scalp lock and bring it back to where it should be and let it be at peace. So I don't want to take too much of your time, but I just wanted to let you all know that, you know, that I enjoy working with, with National Park Service and working with Sand Creek. And this was my um, goal when I started as the Cheyenne director here and then started working with Sand Creek was to, I wanted all of our people to know about Sand Creek, what happened to our people, and to be thankful of who we are and where we come from, who our relatives are, and that they are a strong people, that they were strong people, and that's why we're still here today. Myself, I am very grateful to be here today. I thank my help for making us a strong-willed people. I hope. Thank you. Um, like I said earlier, we uh, invited the representatives from Northern Cheyenne Tribe and Northern Arapaho Tribe Unfortunately, they couldn't make it. Uh, like I said, the one from Northern Arapaho Tribe, Ben Ridgely, he was on his way down, but unfortunately had to uh, turn around. But uh, we were pleasant to know uh, 
that uh, one of the councilmen were able to make it, uh, Willard Gould. So I'm going to call him up here and say a little bit about um, he wants to be more uh, involved. Thank you, Max. Again, my name is Willard Gould, a Northern Rapid Business Councilman. Although, like I said before, I was only involved in this uh, project for maybe about a year. Uh, I was familiar with it, but uh, the process that they were going through at the time, all the work that they put in, all the people that's involved, the Methodist Church, the Park Service, the Colorado History, and just many, many others, it's, it's so it's so uplifting and, 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 and encouraging to see this happening, to help us commemorate this 150th anniversary. For those, those were our people that perished, and those are the people that made us proud of who we are. And I think that uh, when the time comes, we need to be out there to pay homage, respect, and honor to those people. They're our people. To show them that we are, move, we are moving ahead stronger and still with a pride that they had instilled in us. And again, I just like to thank you for listening. Aho. Oh. Thank you, Wheeler. Appreciate it. Um, this point in the program, we're almost there. I appreciate y'all still sticking around. And like I said, there's a lot of valuable information that we're going to try to put out. Um, we've learned about a little bit of history, the genealogy, and where we're at present day. Uh, where we're at now, too, is that the state of Colorado is more involved now, and they're making efforts to uh, help us with the 150th anniversary. So we have a representative here from the state of Colorado. Her name is Chantelle Hanshu. And she's going to have put on a, uh, a presentation here, and she's going to talk a little bit about what she, uh, we got going on with the, in conjunction with the History of Colorado. Hello, thank you for that introduction and also for the lovely meal. Um, like you said, my name is Chantel Hanshu, I'm getting some feedback. Um, and I am the program coordinator for the Sand Creek Massacre commemoration on behalf of History Colorado. See if I can stand in a good spot here. Um, so. First, um, I'm new to this position. I just started a few weeks ago, but prior to that, I have worked with the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs under Ernest House Jr., working on all sorts of issues related to Native American people in Colorado, from transportation to healthcare to education, um, you name it, we dealt with it. And so now I'm so, so honored um, to be working specifically on the Sand Creek Massacre commemoration um, on behalf of History Colorado. So, um, History Colorado is a state agency and it's also a nonprofit. And I won't bore you with the history, um, but under, the, under History Colorado, there are nine museums um, throughout the state. And they've been. Um, and let's see. And so History of Colorado, it is a museum, but they also do lots of other um, work with tribes. And so the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act um, that was passed in 1990 really started museums working with Native American tribes um, on, in recognizing their um, sovereign status and conducting formal, respectful consultations. And so during that time, um, consultations were conducted and since then History Colorado has repatriated over 800 individuals and over 2,000 associated funerary objects. Um, however, um, NAGPRA, when it was first passed, didn't provide provisions for remains that were culturally unidentifiable um, and so in response the two Ute tribes um, in the state of Colorado partnered with the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs and History Colorado um, to come up with a process for notifying tribes when remains were discovered. So History Colorado consulted with 48 different tribes with historical ties to the state of Colorado and came up with a process for notifying them in a timely manner, in a respectful manner. And so, um, and so with that, the next step was 
So where are all the lands to rebury these individuals? And it became very evident that lands were not readily available. And so again, with the, um, the two Ute tribes led the way and they, um, they partnered with several state agencies, several, several federal agencies, and are now currently working on a, what we call a Colorado lands work group um, to be able to find additional lands to rebury individuals close to where they were found. Um, and so the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes have been very involved in this whole process and History Colorado um, has been and continues to consult with them around issues regarding NAGPRA. So NAGPRA, as I said, really opened the door for a lot of um, different consultations. So History Colorado began working on other things that involved, the tri involved various tribes, including um, a tribal paths exhibit that um, was shown in the early 90s. And so there were several consultations that were done to come up with the content of this. And in the exhibit, um, the Sand Creek Massacre and the Healing Run were both included. More recently, History Colorado um, has created a Living West exhibit, which highlights how humans interact with water. And in this, they also consulted with various Pueblo tribes about the history of the Mesa Verde region. So this brings us, so um, one more thing that I wanted to mention was the Ute Museum expansion. So there's a Ute Museum in Montrose, Colorado. And so History Colorado has consulted with them about the building design. Here you see the old or the current design on the left and on the right you see a building twice as big. Um, it'll be very visible from the highway and there have been extensive consultations about what does that building look like um, and then now we're moving into what are the exhibits going to look like. How do we tell the story of all of the Ute people and um, let people know that the Ute culture is still thriving. So this brings us to the Sand Creek Massacre exhibit. So out of the Tribal Paths exhibit, um, History Colorado recognized the need for telling this tragic, horrific, but yet very important story of the Sand Creek Massacre. But it wasn't done quite right. The rule for consultations, um, coming from the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs, we always say consult early, consult often. And unfortunately, it wasn't done quite right in this case. So as um, Henry mentioned earlier, the, consult the exhibit was closed during consultations. It still remains closed. But in the meantime, the three Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes in the state of Colorado negotiated a memorandum of agreement, an MOA. So sounds very governmenty, right? Definitely, I think. So these are the parties to the MOA. Um, all, of the, all of the tribes signed along with the state of Colorado and the National Park Service as a consulting party. And what does the MOA actually say though? Like, what, is, what does that mean? So it, what, the outline of the MOA is to, um, to provide for a way to cooperate, to communicate, and to, um, and to consult on a regular basis. And so whenever History Colorado wants to do anything in regards to the exhibits about the Cheyenne and Arapaho people, about any events or commemorations about the Cheyenne and Arapaho peoples, or about any artifacts from the Cheyenne and Arapaho peoples, there must be a formal consultation. And really that just means that we need to be able to talk to each other in an open, candid way to be able to work together on issues that are mutually, um, that we're mutually interested in. And so there are a lot of different guidelines to the MOA and it's really jargony um, and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards or to provide you a copy. But the main sticking point of the MOA is that we have to work together on a government to government basis and that we're going to meet once, at least once a year. Um, and so that's, that's what we're sticking to right now. And so, So, the, so since the memorandum of agreement was signed, um, there have been consultations on a few different tracks. So we have a short-term track, and we're talking with a smaller group about what, can we, what kind of exhibit can we put up in time for the 150th anniversary in November. And exhibits take a very long time <laughs> to create, and so we're doing it 
doing it um, very efficiently right now. And we'll have something to show at the History Colorado Center in Denver um, by November. And it will, be, it will tell a, a brief story of the Sand Creek Massacre. There's another track, um, a longer term track, where, we talk, where we're talking about, so how do we tell the whole story of the Sand Creek Massacre? How do we talk about all of the pieces that fit together and all of the effects that came after the massacre? And how do we do that in a respectful way that doesn't just incorporate tribal voices, but is led by tribal voices? And so those are the two different tracks. And the other um, event that History Colorado is putting on, as Henry mentioned earlier, is a feast. So at the end of the healing run, on December 3rd, it's a Wednesday, um, everyone will gather at the Capitol and then um, will be the, tribe, the tribal reps will be issuing tickets um, for a feast hosted by History Colorado for the runners, descendants, and families. So um, keep your ear out, ears out for more information from um, the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribal reps about that. So more support from Colorado on the same day that the Memorandum of Agreement was signed. Because Colorado recognizes that we need to educate the public about the Sand Creek Massacre and that we can't allow atrocities to happen like this ever again in the future, um, the governor signed an executive order creating the Sand Creek Massacre Commemoration Commission. It's a mouthful. So the Commemoration Commission is chaired by the governor and lieutenant governor. And it has um, a ton of different members. Skip around here. Um, so we have members from all of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes, actually all of the tribal reps at the table. <laughs> um, History Colorado has a seat on it. We're represented by Ed Nichols, the president of History Colorado. We have local entities, the city of Denver. We have National Park Service. We have um, the Methodist Church, Elif School of Theology, University of Denver, the state, the Colorado State and Veterans Department. The list goes on. This group of people is really historic to come together. They haven't been pulled together quite in this way before, um, and they've been working on a lot of different issues. So the, the Commemoration Commission is really the clearinghouse for all events that are happening around the 150th anniversary. Um, it's a really good way to pull people together and communicate and coordinate that way. We're working on a lot of different projects at the Commemoration Commission. Um, financially, we're working on figuring out ways to help support runners and their families as they travel for the healing run. Logistically, we're sending out invitations to all sorts of people, including the state and US dignitaries of Colorado, Oklahoma, Wyoming, and Montana. Um, and we're also, we're also running um, a website to get, up, to get out the word about the Sand Creek Massacre. What is the 150th anniversary? How do I get involved? Um, and then emotionally, too, because like I said earlier, this group is a group of people who maybe wouldn't be pulled together otherwise. And they're coming together in amazing ways and sharing insights and working together. Um, so like I said, we're, um, the point of the Sand Creek Massacre Commemoration Commission is to be a clearinghouse for all of the 150th commemoration events. And so we've created this website, sandcreekmassacre150150.com. And so there are flyers in the back. Be sure to grab one so you remember the website. But this, has, this will have all of the information about the healing run. It will have information about other events going on, most of them in the Denver area. Um, but it's, it's being updated continuously, so please continue to check back um, for more information about the healing run. And finally, um, another very government-y title up here. The text on the side is the title of the Senate Joint Resolution that was passed this spring. And this resolution was passed by both Colorado um, bodies of govern government, and they are, the whole point of it is to recognize the 150th and educate the public once again that this event not only happened, but that the effects are still being felt today and that, it, um, and that it's a very uh, significant event. And so, it, again, if you would like copies of the Sen Senate Joint Resolution, um, please see me afterwards. I'm happy to give those to you. Um, so with that, um, thank you so much for your time. 
I'm more than happy to speak with any of you individually, so please track me down afterwards, and, um, and I'll, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you very much for your time, um, and I'm so honored to be a part of this commemoration. Thank you. So now I'd like to call our National Park Service representative, Ms. Karen Weil. She's a tribal liaison at the Sand Creek Massacre site. She's going to explain a little bit about what, how the site is doing now. Thank you. You know, I grew up just a poor urban Indian girl in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so I don't feel appropriate to be up there trying to talk to you all. I want to be down here with the people, which is what my life is about, is working on behalf of Native people, whether it's my tribe, your tribe, or the Ute tribe, because I used to work for the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs. I'm here to tell you a little bit more about the Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site. I work with the park management, I work with the National Park Service at a larger level, and I also work with the Cheyenne Arapaho, Oklahoma, Wyoming, Northern Arapaho, and Montana, Northern Cheyenne. My job is to keep them informed and to keep the park informed of what it is that the tribal representatives would like to see or like to do. Sometimes it can be hard as a native person working for the federal government because I am Indian first and sometimes the federal government policies and guidelines are a little bit stronger than what I'd like to see. In this case though, as working on behalf of the Cheyenne and Arapaho people at Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site, it's a win-win situation. We get to um, manage the land, the cultural and natural resources of the site where the Cheyenne and Arapaho people were massacred, where they weren't allowed to be buried. So therefore, the site that we have, that we hold in perpetuity on behalf of the Cheyenne and Arapaho people, we maintain it as it is. We are trying to restore it back to the 1864 uh, natural resources that were there, and we have some very good, more than very good, we have excellent staff that is working on that. And I'd like to commend them and let them know, let you know who they are. Dr. Alexa Roberts is our superintendent. She's our boss, although she doesn't feel like a boss. She works with us hand in hand. She works with the tribal representatives hand in hand. I have known some of your tribal representatives since 1996 and Alexa Roberts has been with them since the early years of finding the site where she went through the um, oral histories of some of the elders that have passed on now as well as some of our current tribal representatives. So Alexa has been involved with the Sand Creek Massacre site location study as well as today managing the site as a superintendent. Carl Zimmerman is our operations manager. He's the one who's actually out at the site because we have two offices. We have uh, the actual site just uh, east of Eads, and we also have our administrative offices, which is where I work out of. Carl is one who keeps the site going. He's uh, very knowledgeable in natural resources, and he does all of that work out there, along with Derwood Miller, who is considered our maintenance man, but he's much, much more. He makes sure that the lands are taken care of, um, making sure that there is fire mitigation, so if there were ever a fire on the prairie out there that it would uh, be mitigated as soon as possible. We have Janet Frederick, who is our administrative tech, Sean Gillette, our chief of interpretation, Marsha Will Clifton, who is our partnership specialist, Craig Moore, ta -da, right here, Craig Moore, um, our ranger, and remarkable researcher and genealogist. He has all this stuff in his head, you guys. I'm going to promote him to, to say that you guys need to call him to get your genealogy down before any more of your elders pass on. As more children are born, he can find it for you. So you're going to get lots of calls, Craig. Um, Jeff Campbell, he's our seasonal guide and also a researcher. He has a criminal investigator background, so he uh, has investigated the site, the massacre site, at, from a criminal perspective and also from a military perspective. What happened? Why did Colonel Shivington do this? What direction did he come from? 
Um, you know, where were Silas Sewell standing? Where was, we're just looking for more and more information on the site and how we can put it together in, in the light of history. Eric Senyo, who is currently on a detail to another park, but he's our park guide, and I believe that's all of us now. Um, I did want to tell you also some of the things we're doing for the 150th. Not only are we working with the state of Colorado, but we're also working at a national level in putting, putting together, we did the uh, Civil War and the Sand Creek uh, film, which you saw earlier, but was a little hard to, to hear. We're going to debut that at the National Museum of the American Indian on October 9th. On October 9th, which is a Thursday, and those are the dates, that is a date they offered us that they could, we could use one of their theaters to have the um, Sand Creek Massacre 150th, 150th Year Remembrance Symposium and Film Debut. So we have a lot of our, what we call subject matter experts, our historians, as well as tribal representatives who are going to be there to talk about the causes and consequences of the Sand Creek Massacre, the generations since the massacre, multi-generational impacts. Do you realize that your tribe is still suffering from what happened generations ago, 150 years ago? You know, we, the, some of our subject matter experts, our historians can tell you some of those impacts. Also memorialization and healing. We had former Colorado U.S. Senator, um, Ben Nighthorse Campbell, who brought forth this legislation that created this National Historic Site. He's going to be with us and talking about that. We have your own Dr. Henrietta Mann, the president of the Cheyenne Arapaho Tribal College, joining us up there. Of course, we have uh, Dr. David Hollis, uh, Dr. Gary Roberts, Jeff Campbell that I mentioned earlier. We have Craig Moore coming. We have uh, Dr. Richard Little Deer, I'm sorry, Little Bear, from um, the Chief Dull Knife College in Lame Deer. He's the president there. Let's see, who else do we have? We have Karen Little Coyote, um, Tom Meyer. He's a historian and very knowledgeable on the northern Arapaho. Uh, he worked with uh, Eugene Ridgely Sr. to create that elk hide up there. And I wanted to make sure we, you guys were able to see that because that is a very historical piece that um, we're all very proud of. And his uh, sons are involved with us as a, uh, uh, Tribal Councilman Gould mentioned uh, Ben Ridgely was supposed to be here but had car trouble. Norma Gourneau, who is a Northern Arapaho, I'm sorry, Northern Cheyenne a member of their uh, Cultural Commission up there is coming with us. Um, Ari Kelman, who wrote this book right here, A Misplaced Massacre. It, this is the most recent, I think, um, book created about Sand Creek Massacre. He's coming and he's going to talk about that and of course we have um, Henry Littlebird going to join us up there also. Um, a little bit more about the Civil War and Sand Creek Massacre. The massacre was designated as one of five sites west of the Mississippi that was um, involved or had an affiliation with the Civil War. Some of you of course had U.S. history, Civil War happened uh, or I should say Sand Creek Massacre happened during the time of the Civil War. So that's a very important piece of how those two were tied together. And that's why we created this, um, this documentary. Some of the other things we're doing is I wanted to make sure that you got a copy of our brochure. This is our brochure for the park site right now. We are currently re-editing it and looking at it again. But it does tell you what the site looks like in the southeast Colorado. It tells you where we're located and it tells you more history about the site. In the uh, program that Karen and um, Max created tonight, you see on the inside the uh, Sand Creek, well it says battleground, but it's the Sand Creek, um, what we call our monument, we call it Monument Hill. It's our pivotal point 
where you can look out over the prairie, over the bluff, and see where the massacre happened. It's a place, it's a sense of place. It means you have to come and be there to feel what happened. It's not like Yellowstone or Mount Rushmore or any of those other places. As you know, this is a massacre, and it was designated as a massacre in 1865 after they finished uh, investigating what had happened. So it's been designated a massacre by um, the U.S. and by the military since those dates. I do have some information here for the kids. These are what we call our, uh, let's see, Civil War to Civil Rights educational cards. And they're basically kind of like the size of a baseball trading card. It's got different pictures on them. This is Captain Silas Sewell. It's got a very brief little history about what happened, where, who he is. And some of these other information, there's um, some Cheyenne people on here. There is the al Qaeda painting. So the kids are welcome to come up and get it. You're welcome to have them. We have a few that we'd like to give out. Um, the Sand Creek Spiritual Healing Run begins at the Monument Hill. So when you come and you participate in the Sand Creek Spiritual Healing Run, you will be on site at the massacre. It begins there. There is a lot of information, a lot of, of um, I'm not sure what I'm trying to say, M marketing. There's a lot of things going on in the state of Colorado, as you just heard from Chantel. But we, the, those that are stewards of the park, would like for you to know that you, the spiritual healing run begins on site. And the reason it begins on site is because the Cheyenne and Arapaho people who were brutally mur murdered and then dismembered and those body parts carried to Denver, this is the reason they follow that site. And I'm sorry I didn't mean to step on Caden's toes. He's going to be talking about that in a little bit. The last thing I want to point out is that in the site location study, chapter 5, it's a big thick bound book that, that anybody can have access to. It's on our website. But we're, we are producing um, a portion of that. That is the oral history project, which is chapter five of this site location study. We are reproducing it so that tribal members can have a free copy of what our elders and other people told us about the site. So it is specifically about the location of the site back in the 19, uh, late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, we've also included some blank sheets in the back of it so that you can document your history, your descendancy to the Sand Creek Massacre, and then send it to us because we would like to know more about um, people that know their history and people that know um, who their descendants are, who their ancestors were that were at the massacre site. If not, let's find out. Craig can help a lot with that. Another. Um, Another point there for Craig. Um, I did want to say that we do have the Black Kettle Wildland Firefighters and the Northern Cheyenne Fire Crew, which Caden is a member of, coming down to help us manage the site. They help mitigate and help um, clear out the site. This past summer, we had tons and tons and tons of tumbleweeds, tons of them. I was going to walk behind our little tree line, and I got back there, and the, the tumbleweeds were this high. The trees were another, you know, 20 feet above me, but I had to stop because I couldn't go any further. I was going to be consumed by tumbleweeds. The uh, firefighters' crews came and helped us clear those tumbleweeds from the trees that were back there. I wished I'd have brought my picture to show you just how deep those tumbleweeds were, but we thank the the uh, fire crew, we thank the tribal representatives, we thank uh, the state of Colorado, and everybody else that is involved to help us out. Please come to the Sand Creek Spiritual Healing Run. Please come on November 29th and um, honor our site, the Sand Creek Massacre site, as well as your own descendants. I think that's about all I have to say. Oh, I wanted to point out this, the P repatriation site. Chantel was talking about um, those uh, American Indian human remains that are repatriated, repatriated means returned, I had to look that word up myself back when I was doing NAGPRA. Anyway, um, so we do have a repatriation site where any 
human remains, Cheyenne Arapaho descendants, that are found to be traced back to the Sand Creek Massacre can be buried at the site. Your ancestors that were uh, murdered there were not um, buried. They were not allowed to go back and bury their people that were killed. So we have a site specifically set aside by federal legislation, the leg same legislation that creates this site where you can, um, those remains can be reburied. I think that's it. It is a very, uh, I don't know, it's a very spiritual site that you really need to come and experience. I know it, it showed me what was there when I first came to view the site, so it is something you really need to see. Thank you very much for your time, and I really appreciate you coming and staying this long. All right, next uh, one is also going to talk about the GMP, General Management Plan, basically the future of the Sand Creek Historical Site. And to do that is another National Park representative, uh, Tom Thomas. Thanks very much, Max, and thanks to all of you. Um, the, the plan we're, we're going to discuss very briefly here is the plan that was required by legislation by Congress for the future management of the site. Um, we're very fortunate in the legislation that Congress created. It was, it was very thoughtful, very detailed, and provided great guidance for the future of the site. We believe we've captured the intent and, and um, spirit of what Congress intended for the site, so we'll walk through that very quickly and you, you'll see where we're at in the planning process. As I said before, we're very close, we believe, to completing the planning process. Um, there's just one more step, which is the official public process, which will occur within the next month. So uh, this is a quick preview of where the plan's at, and uh, we'll move forward very quickly. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the historical and physical context of the site, a little bit about the legislation. We want to emphasize that the tribes have been part of this process from the beginning, long before my time, going back to the site location study, the creation of the legislation, and the planning process itself. This, um, unlike you would see at any other National Park Service site, this really is the tribal plan. Um, we're required by law to look at alternatives for management of the site. We'll talk very briefly about those. We're going to discuss what we call the preferred alternative. We have not quite gotten to that stage yet. Until the Park Service says this is the government's preferred alternative, we're still short of that, but we have a preliminary preferred that we can talk about as well. And then we'll talk about next steps in the planning process. So for those of you who have not been here, you can see a, a, a quick uh, geographic context for the site, the, the vicinity and region in southeastern Colorado, that, that slightly L-shaped green uh, shape in the map, in the um, upper center of the map, that is the site itself. 2,350 acres um, operated by the National Park Service. Here's a, a shot of the existing conditions at the park. We're using a lot of the old ranch facilities um, for management, the, the big barn left over from um, the ranch that was on the site beforehand, a few other facilities. We're really keeping development very spare at the site. We want to keep the landscape preserved to the greatest degree possible, consistent with the, the, um, uh, the letter of the legislation. Again, here's um, a little more detail of the site itself. Um, the, the vast majority of the site is underdeveloped or undeveloped. You'll see the, the development areas in the, in the lower part of the map. When you look at the small insets to the right, you'll see the administrative area, and then you see um, a view of the repatriation site, parking area, and the Monument Hill, which overlooks the Valley of Sand Creek itself. That's the road leading up to the Monument Hill. You can see our, our very modest um, park visitor contact station and book sales. And then, as Karen just referenced, that area just past the fence line and past the interpretive sign is the repatriation area where remains of the victims of Sand Creek are reinterred. 
So quick history of, of planning. We commenced tribal consultation on the plan itself in 2007. That continues right to this moment. Um, we did uh, quick public involvement meetings in 2008. We've been working with the state of Colorado and Kiowa County throughout the planning process as well as the tribes. Um, we've had two alternative concept workshops. As I said before, we're required by law to look at alternatives to management for the site. Those workshops were conducted in 2007 and 2009, and at both of those workshops, all the tribes were represented, the state, Kiowa County representatives, and the National Park Service. We went forward with the alternatives in 2011, um, worked with the tribes to develop what we considered a team preferred alternative, brought that before the Intermountain region of the National Park Service earlier this year, and now we are involved in the Washington review of the plan. So we are that close to releasing this plan for public review. And as you'll see, we've got the, the infamous recruiting poster for the 3rd Colorado Cavalry that was released in August of, of 1864. We'll talk a bit more about this, but we want to be meticulous in representing the historical context of the events of Sand Creek and the aftermath of the massacre. This document's going to get a very wide distribution, and we would be doing history and an injustice if we didn't use that opportunity to bring the history of Sand Creek before as many people as we possibly can. And, and I'm pleased that we think the, the history in the GMP mirrors very closely the wonderful historical presentations and film you've seen tonight. And if we have time, I'll, I'll walk you through that very quickly. So again, our partnerships with the tribes is, is critical to our planning process. Um, this is building on a, a long relationship, nearly 20 years going back to, the, to David's early work in, in bringing this um, significant site before the federal government and the development of the site location study and the establishment legislation. And as I said, all the tribes have been represented very closely um, and, and worked with us very closely to, to develop this, this draft management plan. We also are very cognizant that in this sesquicentennial year, the, the 150th anniversary of the massacre, many, many things are, are coming to the fore. The creation of the Governor's Commission, R.A. Kelman's book, which has received national recognition, one of the highest honors in, in American history, writing the Bancroft Prize, um, the United Methodist Investigations, the bipartisan resolution by the General Assembly, um, Sand Creek is very much in the history and, and the minds and the public eye of, of the United States right now, and, and we think that is a wonderful thing, and we want to capitalize on that by bringing the plan forward and, and adding more momentum to this recognition of this infamous event. As I said before, we're very um, dedicated to bringing the history forward in this GMP as, as accurately as we can. This makes it different. It looks differently. It reads differently than most government planning documents. Um, so we not only want to focus on the event itself, but we've put a lot of effort into developing the historical context leading up to that event. It's really not completely understandable if you don't know that history. And we also want to capture the history of events after Sand Creek, the tragic impact on the tribes throughout the West that resulted from the massacre at Sand Creek and the warfare that followed. So we have a range of alternatives. I, I won't walk you through that because I know we're short on time. But to be very quick in summarizing, the legislation directed us to provide opportunities for reverence, commemoration, contemplation, for interpretation and education, for preservation of the site, and also manage the site in such a way as to minimize the potential of, of acts like this occurring in the future. All of those really critical legislative mandates from Congress are reflected to one degree or another in these alternatives. Our preferred alternative places the greatest emphasis on resource preservation, but we do provide for visitor access to the site. We will have some interpretation on this site. Minimal facilities to allow for the management of the site, but, but minimal so that it does not impede these, this critically important historical landscape. So we're going to jump ahead to that one very quickly. Um, very small minimum uh, uh, facilities on the site. Once again, you see the, uh, the Sand Creek Battleground map, um, 
monument here at, at the Monument Overlook and a, a snapshot of the 1860, of the, um, the Valley of Sand Creek itself. We'll be working to preserve these components of the cultural landscape to the greatest degree possible. We want to provide accessibility so that all citizens, tribal members, and everyone, regardless of their level of ability, can access the site and, and gain an appreciation of the site and, and the history that it reflects. Again, we want to focus on that broad historical context. Much of that would be addressed in the visitor center and research center in the town of Eads. And once again, that research center, we believe, is critical to this congressional mandate to educate the people in such a fashion as to reduce the chance of, of events like this occurring in the future. So this is what the map looks for our preferred alternative. Over 90% of the site resides in one or another of, of resource preservation zones. We do allow some development. As you can see, there's, there's a small trail that leads from the administrative area in that dark brown area at the center, running northwest to what everyone agrees is one of the most important um, vistas and visitor experience sites in the entire monument. Um, that view provides a, a tremendous um, vantage point from which to view the entire valley of Sand Creek and be able to, to view the, um, the route of people who were fleeing the massacre after the troops attacked early that morning. Um, so minimal development. That purple area in the bend of the stream is, is the contemplative area established for tribal members to conduct traditional ceremonies and observances. Um, enough land to, or enough facilities to enable the park staff to manage the site effectively, but again, focused very much on preserving the landscape as it appears to this day. So our next steps, we'll conclude the Washington review of this document um, the day after tomorrow, actually. We will then take this document before the deputy director of the Park Service. She will give us the green light to publish this, and at that point, we'll be in the public process. And from that point, it's our hope to complete the plan, possibly even sign it by the end of the spiritual healing run um, in early December 2014. So we're very close. And again, we would not be anywhere without the help of, of the Sand Creek Tribal Committees, everybody who has worked so hard to develop this plan, and all of you who have, who have devoted your energy collectively to making the establishment of Sand Creek a reality and, uh, and helping us formulate this plan. So I, I couldn't be more pleased to be here and tell you that we've just about concluded this effort. And um, if things change in the plan, we will come back and tell you. But right now, what you're looking at, I sincerely believe, is the plan that we're going to have going forward. If, if that changes, I'll come back. We'll talk about those changes. Otherwise, um, we'll release this plan for public review. If you would like a copy of the GMP, please note on the sign-in sheet with your address and name and just put GMP next to your name and we'll mail you a hard copy. But it will also be um, published online where you can, you can see it on the park's website. Um, let me take just one more moment, if you don't mind. Um, hmm. Mm-hmm. Again, very quickly, we want this document to look and read differently than most planning documents, so we have worked very hard to articulate this history, um, and our history follows very closely the history we saw in the narrative film. We want the American people reading this document to understand that Sand Creek was not just a, a random one-off event, that it is the result of a long process of conquest and expansion by the United States into the American West. And we feel we've done a good job telling that story. I hope you will agree when, when you read this document. And, um, and we want to use this document, as I said before, to bring the history to the people. So when you see the GMP, you'll be able to follow this long narrative, as David described so eloquently before, 
this, this tremendous period of expansion, which was a devastating shock to the tribes, and over a period of less than 20 years, they went from controlling nearly half the state of Colorado, as well as vast other lands outside Colorado. And by 1869, the tribes had no foothold in the, in the territory of Colorado whatsoever. And I think most Americans are not really cognizant of that history and the devastating impact it had on the tribes. We want to use this document to bring that message forward. So um, I look forward to your comments. And I want to thank you again for your time. This has been a great honor for me. The dates for this year we actually are going to start on November 30th. Um, run from November 30th to December 2nd. We're going to cover 180 miles. Um, that is our goal, well, kind of our goal. And then once we reach 180 miles, we skip into Denver and run four miles through downtown Denver um, and walk one from 15th and Arapahoe to the Colorado State Capitol. There's the map on there, the running route is a little different. That one showed the major highways. Um, we don't take the major highways just for safety concerns. We stay on the county roads, the sand and dirt roads. Um, so that gets tiring when you're running. Um, if there's any other questions or any more info you want on the healing run, just stop me and just ask me questions or I'll give you my contact info and I can give you more um, documentation, uh, videos and um, pictures on the healing runs in the past. Thank you. All right, thank you, Caden. You can uh, get with him on any information about the spiritual healing run if you want to be involved with it. He's the coordinator. Also, our respect program is going to be coordinating uh, the run on our end, so you can contact their offices for if y'all are interested, or if you know somebody that's interested um, that wants to sign up, they can contact respect office, and they'll be working with Caden and uh, up until the November 29th.